take weed. When uh when I was locked up, like I couldn't get my wife any gifts. So I had one of my friends make her this calendar. And it's just like, pictures like from our visits and everything. Nice. Like the whole calendar is just like our little visits with our family. That's beautiful. That's sweet. So we yes. I did something like that for say cool. Um, um, because I had an event, uh, like a gathering of women who I said helped me fly. Yeah, your and, your, party, your celebration. Yes, my celebration. And so, um, this sister was the photographer, and we went out like throughout the 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 Brooklyn area, beaches and all kinds of stuff to take pictures to mark the seasons, and I made it into a calendar. And sent it into him. Oh, I bet he loved this shit. Out yeah, of yeah. <laughs> was... We get creative. You gotta. You yes. Gotta. Little things. But that, like... You know, they mean to. They mean to break us up. They mean to destroy families. All their bullshit talk. Talk. Oh, my language. Oh, no, All their talk. It out. Oh, oh, they talk about family values and wanting this. They don't want people to come and visit. That's why they make it so hard and they discourage oh, people. Oh, every, right. That's right. So the fact that we maintain is an act of resistance. The fact that we love through the bars, we maintain oh, our relationship. Resistance. That's right. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we're going to kick it off here. Um, such a pleasure to have you all. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And uh, we're really excited to be hosting this conversation as part of the Rattling the Cages series, uh, specifically this one for Black August, um, which you may know is a month-long commemoration of Black resistance, paying tribute to the lives and sacrifices of captured freedom fighters. Uh, Firestorm, uh, the collective I'm part of, is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective uh, here in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that um, reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Um, we're also continuing to do a fair number of these types of events uh, online, uh, both because it sort of expands the range of what we're able to do, and also because we know uh, virtual events remain a lot more accessible for many folks in our community. So uh, we do have several exciting upcoming virtual events that I just wanna mention um, in September, including another event in the Rattling the Cages series that you should definitely sign up for, uh, as well as a uh, conversation with writer and prison abolitionist, Victoria Law. Um, so if you're interested in keeping up with us, definitely follow us on social media and I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. But back to tonight. Uh, tonight's event is a fundraiser for the Jericho Movement, uh, which has been fighting to win amnesty and freedom for political prisoners for over 25 years. Um, and I think as of this afternoon, uh, it looked like we'd raised, uh, with your help, about $200. And I'll drop a donation link in the chat. Would love to see some more, um, some more money flow their way. Uh, such important work. So note that we are using Zoom's Q&A tool tonight uh, as we go. Um, if you've got questions or anything you want to share, please definitely make use of that Q&A tool. If you're on your phone, I think it's probably at the top of your screen. If you're on a laptop, I think it's at the bottom, but it's it's two little speech bubbles. Uh, you just click on that and type out a question, and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can. So we're going to get started here. Just want to introduce um, our amazing guests. Uh, First up, we've got Dekwi Kioni Siddiqui, uh, who is a coordinating committee member of the Spirit of Mandela Co Coalition, uh, the former chair of the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, uh, and leader of the Sakua Odinga uh, Defense Committee, which waged, waged a successful campaign uh, for the release of her husband. A consistent coalition builder and organizer, Dekwi is a retired educator with the New York City Department of Education and a member of the Jericho Movement to Free All Political Prisoners. She's co-editor of Look For Me in the Whirlwind from the 21st, uh, excuse me, from the Panther 21 uh, to 21st Century Revolutions, which I've got a copy of right here, uh, and also a contributor to Black Power After Lives, The Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Dekwi. Thank you. We also got 
Um, we've also got Harold Taylor, uh, who joined the ALA chapter <laughs> of the Black Panther Party in 1967 and spent much time in jail for his part in the Black liberation struggle. Uh, Harold was arrested in 1973 in New Orleans and charged along with others in the 1971 attack on a police station in San Francisco. The case was dismissed after it surfaced that the defendants were brutally tortured by the police. In 2007, he was arrested again in connection with the decades old case along with seven other men known collectively as the San Francisco Eight. Uh, but charges were eventually dropped against Taylor and others uh, the two former Panthers did plead to lesser charges. Uh, and finally, um, kind of uh, facilitating the conversation, uh, we've got Eric King, uh, who is a father, poet, author, and activist. Uh, last December, he was released from the Supermax uh, ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner uh, for an act of protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, Eric's held, was held in solitary confinement for years and met with violence uh, by guards um, throughout his incarceration. And Eric uh, has published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing My Cell. Uh, his sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. And Eric now works as a paralegal for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. Uh, it's a huge honor and pleasure to have the three of y'all with us tonight. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from all of you. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead now and pass it off to Eric. You're muted, Eric. Uh-oh. Glad to be here, glad to be here. Um, so Daqui and Harold, the uh, the, main topic of this talk, even though we're going to stray from it, of course, is Black August, which we're celebrating right now. And so I was wondering if you two could both tell us or share with us the the first times that like you heard of that concept or the first time you celebrated or the first time um, that, uh, that you participated in a Black August and what it meant to you then and perhaps what it means to you now. If a uh, Harold, do you want to go first and then Daquie follow up? Well, yes. Uh, Black August to me. First, uh, you know, I was I was here in Los Angeles in 1965, in August of 1965, when the Watts riot started, when there were over 30 something black people were killed in that riot. And I was uh I was just 17 years old at the time. Me and my friends, we went up on Avalon in 114th Street, 112th, or in that area where they were, where it started at, where it initiated at, to participate in that rebellion. Even though they called it a riot, we called it a rebellion because of the conditions that we were forced to live up under, under the segregation, the police brutality, you know, and the unlawfulness of the police in the community, and the avaricious businessmen in the community that was uh, jacking up prices in the community just the unsafe things that was happening in the community all at, all in one, all at the same time during that time. That that was the first time I had experience with Black August. That's, and then I understand that it came, also it was named uh, because of Marcus Garvey. I think his birthday is in August. And also a number of different incidents that took place in August. Also the death of Jonathan Jackson when he went into the courtroom in Marin County to free his brother George and uh, at the time, uh, a lot of people don't know, but hardly ever mention other brothers. William, well, William Christmas, <laughs> and Ruth, they were they were there that day that uh, Jonathan decided to take uh, matters in his own hands. Brave young soldier, brave. I had an opportunity to meet Jonathan as a young man. He used to come to the Panther office quite a bit. Very enthusiastic, very dedicated, and loyal to his brother. Him and his whole family, they were great contributors to the local festivities in the, in the community and liberation struggle all of them. And Angela Davis was part of it too. But they were in different parts of the city. I mainly worked out of the office here in Los Angeles. And Black August started with that with me, then with George getting killed and uh, being assassinated in uh, 2001. Uh, maybe you guys didn't know it or not, but 
that police raid took place a week after George was killed. Where um, the same, where, where that raid on police station took place a week after that George was killed. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I was charged with that murder. Incarcerated in Los Angeles when I was charged with that murder. I was incarcerated for a, a shooting incident with the Los Angeles Police Department. The FBI and the criminal conspiracy section at LAPD set myself up and two other brothers to be assassinated. This is uh, in September. It was September the 10th, mm. 1971. At nine o'clock in the evening, I was in a car with two other brothers. We pulled over by the LAPD and a SWAT team, and they opened fire on us. And they shot in the car over 250 times. We all survived. And we went to court. And uh, <clears throat> this all came back from August. That's when I was charged with the murder in San Francisco. But uh, they never brought me to San Francisco because we bailed out of jail after spending two years just fighting to get the bail reduced and to get a and fight very sex election in Los Angeles. We wanted, somebody's trying to call me. I can't talk to them now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Kui, why don't you jump in and tell us your, your experiences with the history of uh, history of Black August? I think that's some of what, um, sure. Um, I learned about the, the the Black August, not so much as a celebration, but a commemoration of Black resistance to remember as you, you know, started out with the, you know, the history of Black August, political prisoners, Black resistance, um, and people who give their, give their lives or, or, and people who have been murdered and imprisoned by the, um, by the state. And I think one of the things that when Harold was speaking, it's important to note is that the Attica Rebellion, like, was, you know, also, like, there were things happening inside the prison, um, the prisons, um, after the murder of, um, of George Jackson, before that, you know, people had been organizing. So I think one of the important things about Black August is for people to understand that it started in the inside, like, uh, brothers were organizing inside the prisons, um, and then it came to the outside. So I found out about it in the nineties. Um, Malcolm X, yeah, I was a member of. I was never a member of the Black Panther Party, but I was a member of an organization, uh, a collective called the Black Panther Collective, and the Black Panther Collective was made up of veteran members of the Black Panther Party and and newer activists. And so it was about carrying on the legacy of the Black Panther Party. So that was my introduction to political prisoners because before that, I had no idea that political prisoners existed in this country. You know, we are taught the mythology of US history and, and, and the idea that freedom and democracy is what makes this, this, this nation work. And that's, that's the furthest thing from the, from the truth. So the Black Panther Collective was my introduction to political prisoners. They were about carrying on the legacy of the Black Panther Party. So it was cop watch, right? Watching the police interaction with people, uh, feeding people in the community. And I was in New York, so it was in New York and visiting political prisoners. So that was both my introduction to political prisoners as well as my introduction to Black August and the Malcolm X grassroots movement used to do uh, a hip hop um, con- hip hop concerts that were a commemoration of Black August with with with, with a multitude of hip hop artists talking about freedom and it was also to raise money to support political political prisoners and so that's how a lot of people found out about Black August because the it was called Black August Hip Hop Concerts, right? Hip Hop Festival, I think it was. Hip Hop Festival. Awesome. But, yeah. Awesome. Um, something you mentioned, uh, you talked about how you used to go and visit prisoners, um, how you started that in the 90s. Could you, could you, and then Harold, after you, could you expand on 
what prisoner support looked like to you then and what maybe what maybe is different about it now? Um, I think that what's different now, thankfully, and it took 30 years from my introduction to political prisoners for more people to talk about political prisoners, mm. right? Because particularly for Black Liberation Army political prisoners, there was, when I first found out about political prisoners, there was like, we had seven just in New York State, seven or eight in New York State, right? And so there were periods of um, lack, virtually no support for political prisoners. Because one of the things that the state did was terrorize people into not supporting political prisoners not being active because they made an example out of our captured freedom fighters and you know criminalizing and so they was harassing and stalking and helicopters was flying over people's homes and people were losing their jobs and put the fbi and police were visiting people's homes so that was terrorizing people into silence so what i saw then was there wasn't this whole big breath there was segments of the population, like the pockets of, of resistance and people carrying on the radical tradition of resistance who visited um, political prisons. But I know from talking to political prisoners that there were times when they had no support because people would say, oh, but weren't they convicted of, you know, killing a police officer, which we, we hold that that's irrelevant. Right, because it's a struggle, it's the freedom struggle, and we have a right to resist whether it's armed or otherwise. Because what the Black Panther Party did was resisted and defended the community. They defended children by feeding hungry children. They defended cash poor and working class communities by feeding hungry people, by providing health care to people who did not. So there are many ways to defend the people, um, but on that, if you look at the Black Panther Party's 10-point platform and program, they were real clear about ending the police terror and murder of Black people. So because of what very, some people were framed, some people acted in military operations against this, against this capitalist oppressive system, we said, and we believe, I believe, that and believe. many others believe that it's irrelevant what they were convicted of. They shouldn't be in prison because even by the US government's own standards and own laws, people have a right to fight against tyranny and oppression. It's just that when it comes to black folks, it is criminalized. It's been criminalized from the days of Harriet Tubman right on up to today. So that's why we have political prisoners because black resistance and resistance in particular, but black resistance in particular, in particular, down to the nitty gritty, are criminalized. So I've seen a change because one of the things we used to say, and I used, I always said this when I would go to speak that, cause like from, from 91 until 2024, I've been aware of political prisoners. I've been working with advocating for supporting, visiting, writing, hosting, organizing events on their behalf, writing letters, facts to, to, to prisons when they were mistreating and abusing political prisoners to try to get them medical treatment because they try, well, you know, Eric, they try to murder you inside prison. So we have to have the support so people have eyes on them. So in saying that for so long, people who call themselves activists and organizers marginalized political prisoners. They weren't a part of their platform. And there are those of us who used to say, you cannot call yourself an activist or radical or revolutionary and not include political prisoners in your platform because they are in prison because whether you're talking about homelessness, hunger, miseducation, lack of health care, every single thing that people struggle for or against, that's what political prisoners are in prison for. So we are remiss. We are derelict in our duties to our, to them and to ourselves when we don't support them. So I see a difference now. I see more people talking about political prisoners and adding them to their platforms. And I'm happy for that. What I'm sad about is so many people gave their lives 
where people didn't know who they were and people still don't know who they are, but they gave their lives to the black freedom struggle, whether they were white, anti-imperialist, whether they were black, new African, whoever, people gave their lives for the struggle for people's self-determination and liberation. And it breaks my heart that there are people who were murdered behind the wall, that people don't know their names, but they sacrificed a whole lot. So I see that as different. Uh, one of the things that still works my heart out is thinking about all of my comrades behind the bars right now that no one will ever know their name. Um, and it really sucks. And also, every cop is a target, and every cop is a legitimate target. Uh, Harold, I don't know if you heard the question, but I was asking, like, what your history with prison support is and how you've seen it change throughout the decades, if you have. Well, you know... Uh... I've never been to prison, but I've been to county jails, but that's no much different from prisons. Because they're gonna isolate you anyway. I spend most of my time in uh with the ASAC, uh the isolation in jailhouses across this country. But mainly uh in San Diego, I I was arrested down there for uh selling Black Panther newspapers and organizing. And while I was in jail there, the split came about in the party. And when I come out of jail, uh, political prisons were being abandoned. The uh, party had to split in it, a lot of confusion. I didn't know which which way was up with the party. But I know I didn't join the Black Panther Party to kill Black people. And they had turned upon themselves, start hurting Black people. And the political prison was abandoned. Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, he was, I, he's, he's, my, but he's my homie, you know. He's my brother and my comrade. He was just 19 years old when he went into prison and he was spent five years on death row. And from death row, he had he commuted to a life sentence, but he died in prison. He just died a few years ago there. And so many have, Noah, Noah Washington, he died in prison in New York. These are all good brothers, all dedicated comrades that the party abandoned due to the Cointel Pro. Cointel Pro was a, not really discovered until after uh, people broke in that office in Philadelphia, in the FBI office, and found all those papers and gave it to uh, the church committee. And the church committee investigated and found the FBI in prison and a lot of people and taking us from different parts. You're not supposed to one from one county and take them to another county. They're supposed to be held in the county. But they relocated me to different jails, just communicate with other people. They want to break that line of communications yep. as far away from home as possible. They don't want you to have any support. But the letters that you get from total strangers, you just don't understand what a lift that gives you on those dark days, those cold mornings when you're trying to drink that. Nasty crap they call coffee just to avoid the food and eat a piece of bread. And you got one letter from a total stranger <laughs> and send you some warm and nice words. Very necessary for people to support prisoners because they're there because they're fighting for the people. And every one of them don't really look for anything in return. We understood that once we were captured, it was on us to figure out how we was going to get out of it. Sometimes our, our, our fellow comrades came to our aid, which was beautiful. Some of them came to our aid and bailed us out of jail at the time, which was beautiful. It gave us an opportunity to get back and continue some of the work. But it's very necessary to support political prisoners because they exist throughout the United States. A lot of them have talked about, a lot of them are never mentioned. Once you are mentioned, it's important as not mentioned. That's right. I just feel strongly for all political prisoners because of the living conditions and the mental torture and how strong you have to be up in that place. It's a challenging thing. I've saw broken men. I've seen men just, just lose it. Yeah, and stand pressure. So it's just for that. We have prisoners. Um, Dave, we, I'd like to ask you, and then Harold, 
what did support look like pre-internet, pre-social media even? Like, what was supporting prisoners? What was that like? Uh, we had Instagram or Facebook, things like that. We had mimeogram machines, you know? <laughs> <laughs> some, some of the people here may not even know what that is, brother. <laughs> I know, but you had black, you had black ink on your hands all the time. Because you had little flyers to announce political prisoners, to announce the programs and everything we were trying to do. Our, our first newspaper wasn't really like the newspaper that you guys seen. They were like mimeogram prints, all into one little staple together. And we sold those papers for a dime. I wish I had them now, they'd be worth a lot of money. I'd buy one. <laughs> yeah, I like that. You know, I think that that's such a good question because the technology is good, right? but it must not replace human contact. Right. So when Harold said he was selling papers, he was on the streets selling right. papers. That meant he was looking at people in the eye, he was touching people, he was talking pe to people, right. he was interacting. So, right. you know, in the 90s, when I came back to New York, when I moved back to New York, um, it was in the streets. It was in parks. It was tabling at places. I remember when um, what's his name? The the Peebles, Ma Melvin Van Peebles or Mario. That's the son. They yeah. did a movie called Panther. This was before the Wakanda stuff, right? Right. But we was at movie theaters, tabling at movie theaters and talking to people about pan real Panthers, not the movie version. And we did the same thing yeah, when yeah. Wakanda came out. We were in movie theaters saying, okay, you saw the fictionalized account, that's Hollywood, but this is the real deal. So we held um, letter writing, uh, monthly letter writing. We used to have in New York City, we used to have the Asada Shakur, Galero Morales, um, um, center, which was at one of the city, at, at a city college campus in Harlem. And both that we know are in exile in, in, in Cuba, right? Um, Asada was liberated by others. Glamo was also liberated and escaped with the help of, with the help of others. And so that center was named after those two revolutionaries to kind of link the correlation and the solidarity and connection between the Puerto Rican independence movement and um, the black freedom struggle. So every month we had letter writing meetings um, and we would send whoever, we had a list of whoever's birthday was for that month and they got birthday cards and we chose a political, one political prisoner that everyone would write a letter to. And so those were some of the things that we that we did. It was really more like hands on in the street, going to do public, um, you know, going to churches and community based organizations, wherever we could go to talk about our political our political prisoners. So this is this is a good outlet, but it should not replace what we re really need to do because we are human beings and we need to connect with human beings. And when there's nothing like human interaction, like what How Brother Howard was saying about what the prison does to separate us and to have this disconnect. Well, this social media does the same thing because people get used to typing on a keyboard and looking at a screen or looking at a recording versus what is what does it mean to really connect with people? And so going to visit political prisoners is, is important, right? And so state is all, in New York state, it's a lot different than if someone is in federal, right? They make it difficult, like what um, Brother Howell said. Going to visit a political prisoner is really, they mean for it to be exhausting because you can live like in New York, you live down in the city and then you got to travel. The last place that Sekou was, it was seven hours away, yeah. right? And then, so all you need in state is an ID. But when, if you want to visit someone in federal, you got to be on their list. You yeah. got to know, you got to get permission to visit. You have to have known them before you went to prison. And so, back, um, right. back exactly. So some people are up for that level of intrusion, although this technology intrudes in our life in every single way possible. 
right? People have their fingerprint on their phone. People have facial recognition. They have this this eye. What is it called? What's that stuff called? IG or IE or something? Mm -hmm. AI, excuse me. I mean, artificial intelligence. Yeah, so we have all these things that's intruding on our lives, but some people don't want that. So when we would have letter writing, sometimes people were concerned about putting their address mm -hmm. on, the, on the envelope because they won't deliver the mail without a return address. So we used to use the center's address as their return address. So there are all these things that get in the way of the support of political prisons unless people are really, really clear about the importance of doing that. And not so much because we're doing something for our political prisoners, but it's a benefit to us. We learn much, we make a connection between the past, present, and the future, right? So like Dr. Clark said, you, history is a time clock. It tells us where we were, where we are, and where we need to go. And so that's the, that's the value and the importance of supporting political prisons. And everybody's not gonna do the same thing. Some people can make phone calls to, that calls a prison to say so-and-so needs to see a doctor, right? Some people can drive a family member to go visit. Some people can donate for a plane ticket for some, a family member to go and visit because our political prisoners don't come from rich families. They come from cash poor and working class families. And now this family has to support not just their family on the outside, but their family on the inside. So there's different levels of support. But what's the main thing is to provide and offer whatever level of support you can. And I've always said, everybody can't do the same thing, but everybody can do something. And every political prisoner that I know, that I visit, that I've spoken with, have always said exactly what Brother Harold said. Getting a letter from someone that says, I learned about you from this event, you know, um, I thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your commitment. That means a lot because it means that they are not, though the state attempts to bury them alive, they are not buried, that they're still among the living. Yeah, that's right. You're so right about that, sister. Mm -hmm. I, man, I had to tell my mother, I didn't want her to come up there to see me because I didn't want to. I, didn't, I couldn't stand the humiliation they would take her through and the way they talk to, her, to black women and the way they treat right. black women in general. And uh, I couldn't handle that kind of shit. So I, I almost got in trouble. I always got in trouble. <laughs> so I encouraged my mother not to come, but being my mother, she made sure my brother came. <laughs> mm -hmm. To be there to see about it. They'll do whatever they want to do if you have no support. They look in the courtroom and if they don't see anybody there, they don't think you have any, you know, nobody's going to miss you, you know. But when you have people there, a family there, just five people just sitting there, they watch what they say and they watch what they do, you know, because they want to do it right. But at the same, well, do it right, do it their damn way. But anyway, I said to all that, say, the basic thing about political prison is that it's a must that we take care of them and make them as comfortable as we can and visit them as often as we can. And let them call. Let them get their phone cards so they can call. Just so they can touch bases with their family. Those are key things. Those are the things that give you that up to fight, to continue that fight. Because you know, you know your sacrifice is worthwhile. And that you know, you're still winning. You're not losing. You know, and a failure but a try. So if you don't try, you already fail. So my motive has always been motivated just by the actions of, the, of my enemy. Because when I make them uncomfortable, I know I'm doing something right. Okay? I love that. <laughs> That's right. Um, so something I experienced inside and something I'm sure both of you have experienced, or I know you probably have, is how difficult the prison system makes it for people when they do visit how they try to demoralize people, how they try to make it to where you can't get in. So if either of you could talk about like, not that, but how you overcame that and how you were able to build special connections with people or build friendships, loves, however, how you're able to overcome the state repression at visits um, to build those strong connections with people. Well, I, I, I can tell you this story right here. Yes. Yeah. The rest of the New Orleans in 72, I jumped bail from the shooting in LA. 
myself and John Bowman and Ray Boudreaux. Myself and, and John Bowman was captured in New Orleans in 72, along with Reuben Scott. And we were beaten, tortured, and they used uh, cattle prods on us, the shockers, under our armpits, between our legs, behind the ears. They beat us with slapjacks all up and down our legs, on our knees, on our shins. It was the most uh, horrific place I've ever been in. And uh, they kept us chained up. You slept with your chains on. Whenever they came to get you out of the cell, they dragged you out of the cell. I stayed in that cell for, for two weeks before the judge took me out of the custody of the city police and made me into the custody of Paris Prison. Paris Prison is no longer there in New Orleans. It was a, it was really a slave quarters where they bought and sold slaves from there. And it was a old, it was built in the 1800s. It was really an old prison. I stayed in there for three months because me and uh, John Bowman, we weren't gonna sign extradition papers. They helped the state. Plus we wanted to stay and testify for Reuben Scott on the five bank robberies that he confessed to under torture. And he got four of them dismissed, one of them held. And I didn't see Reuben Scott no more until three years later when they brought him to court to testify against me in LA on that mm -hmm. shoot. And uh, Reuben refused to testify. You got to understand he asked for an attorney. That's loyalty. That's comrade. Me and Reuben made that deal in New Orleans. We promised each other that we would testify to what the pigs are doing. No matter where we were at, you subpoena me, we'll come testify. And he, they brought him to testify against me, but he flipped on him. And he testified in my behalf on the torture. And that's how the torture was squashed. That's how the case in San Francisco was squashed. But I'm saying that to say that the prison, Paris prison, was the most horrible place I've been. I've been to some jailhouses. Most jailhouses are basically the same. This place was unique. You had guards from Mississippi that couldn't even read or write. Inmates ran the jail. They ran the jail. The inmates had knives. They all knew it. They let inmates in the cell of me and John Bowman to rob us while we were in, the, in there. They didn't know me and John had accumulated some weapons. <laughs> They shut the door when they came in, and we didn't let them out. They didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know. With them. But I'm saying, the things that they did to us to discourage you and to keep people from coming to see you, really, it's crazy. Only same people would do that to another human being. I suffer today post-traumatic syndrome. I have nightmares being shot in the car or either being tortured. Torture is a life sentence. Right. I know I'll never get over it, but I got control over that. I, it was all worth it. I tell you, I wouldn't do it again. Everything I've done in the past, I would do it, again. but this time probably better. Always learn. Harold, um, th thank you, um, Brother Harold. I think that it's so important that you mentioned that. Um, the torture and the isolation. You know, this country won't acknowledge the existence of political prisoners, but there is a special treatment that they have for them when they get behind those walls. I and that, that, that special treatment extends to, I mean, they are particularly vicious, pernicious, degrading, dehumanizing, humiliating to everyone, right? Who is, who is held behind the wall, but it's also particularly so for people who are political prisoners, right? And so the thing that I, I can only speak for myself and what I've seen in going to visit political prisoners. First of all, you are a working, well, the buses was always filled with women, like what, what um, Harold said, his mother, right? So a mother might not say, I'm not going to visit my son or my daughter, but maybe a girlfriend or a wife or a sister 
they may not have that same sense of I got to lay eyes on mm -hmm. him. And so they know this. And so what they do is work to disintegrate those 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 ties. So when I would go to see Sekou, the last place he was, was was in Clinton. It was seven hours away. So I would if I wanted to visit him on Saturday, I'd have to get on the bus Friday night. The bus would come to Brooklyn at nine o'clock Friday night. I'd get on the bus, it would make its stops in, in, in the Bronx and Queens and Manhattan to pick people up. We'd get to Clinton like five o'clock in the morning. Visiting hours don't start until eight or nine. So if you have worked all week long, you have children, you got to pack stuff for the child to eat on the bus. You got to spend money when you get inside the visiting room. You got to spend money when the bus comes back to pick you up. So you visit, you'd visit. visit from nine to three. Sometimes the visiting would be cut short because if the visiting room was too crowded, even though you rode a bus for seven hours and that has happened to me, I would have, my visit would be cut short because there are other people there that want to visit loved ones and there's not enough room in the visiting hours. So you get up there at five o'clock in the morning, they start processing for, oh, thank you, Walla. You, they start processing for, for visiting intake at um, eight o'clock. You finish at three, the bus comes to get you at four. By the time I got home to Brooklyn, it's 11 o'clock Saturday night. So that's a 22, uh, 26 hour, because I already left at five, at nine o'clock Friday night, right? I was fortunate in that my children were grown. I wasn't raising children at the time. So that made it possible. But what happens if you have young children, right? And then you get up there and you deal with the humiliation and the ha harassment. Um, Mogadishu and I went one time to visit Sundiata Akoli. He was in Maryland. And we were in the parking lot and this young woman had take, she had her little girl with her going to visit her man. And she drove, I forget from what state. They wouldn't let the, the baby was like three. They wouldn't let her in because the three-year-old had on a sleeveless dress, right? They said that that was against policy for a three-year-old to have on a sleeveless dress. So she was getting ready to turn around, but thankfully we saw her. We gave her one of our Seku t-shirts and we told her, just turn it inside out, put it on the baby. It was like, a, it came down to her ankles, but they could no longer say that she had on a sleeveless dress so she could have the visit. And she said, well, what do you want for this? We said nothing. Just tell people that they are political prisoners in, in these prisons across the country, right? And so being politicized, and understanding that just like what Brother Harold said, they mean to break you inside, they mean to break you on the outside, and they mean for you not to come back. And the only way to do that, and I've seen that where sisters would say, I'm not, this is why I don't come here. I'm not coming back here. But then some sisters would be, I'm coming here because they knew how deadly it was. Like Clinton, they murder people up there. If you don't lay your eyes on your family member, if like Harold said, you don't get phone calls from people. They can disappear them, kill them, bury them, and you don't know anything. Yeah, so, they are premises. <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah. It's a horrible yeah. situation. So being politicized, which is what the system works so hard against, is people being politicized, which is why they came so hard on the Black Panther Party, because they were politicizing people. They were politicizing people by the fact that they were feeding children, because people were saying, wait a minute, this country that calls itself the richest country in the world can spend money on all of this stuff, but they can't feed my baby, but these young people can? So that was politicizing people. They don't want people to be politicized because then you start looking and understanding the contradictions and then saying, well, wait a minute, I have a stake in this, so I got to fight to change it. One of the things that I, uh, I really admire about my wife and that I just love so much is that when they would come to visit me, they would pack extra clothes for any, uh, any wives or girlfriends or daughters, and the cops hated it. The cops absolutely hated that sort of solidarity amongst visitors. Um, 
if if this is an okay question to ask, Daqui, could you tell me about your first visit with Seku? Like what you remember or or I guess, but just any like positive memories from visits that helped you guys? My uh I'm so sorry. I did. If I hurt you, I'm sorry. No, no. You, you know what? I tell people there's nothing they can say or do that's gonna make me cry more. I miss Seku. I miss everything. My I miss my life with him. So there's no question that people can ask or mention in his name that's gonna make me feel any worse than I already feel. So I think it's important to talk about Seku because he lived a life, and so I don't want people to to be nursing my feelings so that they think they can't say anything about him. I have, I'm struggling through grief and trauma, but I have a whole community. Harold is part of my community, my family. There are lots of people across this country that are helping me through. So you didn't hurt me. It just, it made me smile because I've been visiting political prisoners for a long time before I met him. Sekou who came to New York in 2009. And so of course, because he was, quote, parole to New York State after maxing out his federal time. Um, he came to New York in 2009. So I went to visit him like that's what we do. And so me and um, Ann Lamb went to visit him. She's part of New York City Jericho. And I remember his smile. Like it was really what, what is, I don't, and I think this sticks out for all of the political prisons, right? To juxtapose their humanity. When they say people who were in the Black Panther Party talk about being motivated by great love for the people is why they committed their lives to struggle. You mm -hmm. see that when you visit our political prisons, mm -hmm. right? So when you juxtapose the image and the idea and the writings that this state creates, Right, because anytime Sekou was, was transferred, just like Noah, you would think they was like that movie character, Hannibal Lecter. They put the, 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 the black box on their wrist and their waist and their chains on their ankles and, and mm -hmm. helicopters and, and army trucks, you know, those black vans, the police, uh, you know, a whole big thing. Oh, SWAT. Then, <laughs> yeah, SWAT, that's it, thank you. SWAT yes, team. yes. That's where they but, transported us all the time. All the time. So if you don't know about these people, you're like, damn, what the fuck did they do? Who are they? You think that they was some kind of mass murderer, bomber, or a, a terrorist or something, right? Although we know the United States is a terrorist, right? But then you sit at a table in a visiting room and you see their humanity. You see their smile. You hear them talk. Right, you laugh with them. I found Sekou gentle and loving. I found him funny. And for all the years that I had went to visit political prisoners, I, I always kept it above board because I didn't want to mislead brothers in any kind of way, flirt with them in any kind of way. But I always felt that there was something, they're all special. But there was that extra swag that Sekou Odinga had, if I could say that, right? And so I felt something different. I didn't say anything, but I just really enjoyed my visit with him. Um, and so by 2000, he came in 2009. In two years, we were, we were, we were married because we married in, on June 17th, 2011. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that so much. Yeah. So it's the humanity. Yeah. You see that right away. And then you see the impact that our, our political prisoners have on the community. People have mad respect for all the people that I've gone to see in prison. The people that are held there have mad respect for them because not only who they are, but what they can continue to do. Like, I don't like the word, there are certain words in the English language that I just hate, right? Because the, la the, the language of, of, of this land is really violent and dehumanizing and just, it, I, it's real pro problematic. But I do want to say that our political prisoners are not, not languishing. They are working. 
They're just working in a different environment. They're organizing, they're teaching, they're, mem they're mentoring, they're loving, they're supporting. They're doing different things with, with a different population, but it's the same kind of work they did before they went home, before they went inside there. So I think that the language that we use around political prisoners, that needs to change because ain't none of them languaging. They are still, say, cool and I couldn't go anywhere without people seeing him. When brothers would come home, the first thing they would do is ask somebody for his number and they'd be calling our home or calling his cell phone. And we'd be on a train, we'd be walking the street, wherever we went across this country. And that's not just true of Sekou, that's true of people like when Harold just mentioned Noah. I've had so many brothers over the years mention Noah and Noah's been gone for 20 years, right? It's more than 20 years, right? Yeah, over 20 years. Right. I talked to him time before. Him, him and JB both had but they I talked for about for about 30 minutes. It was just a great feeling. He was so happy. But, I want to say this before before I forget about it. You okay. know, that shootout in that what? you keep breaking up, brother. You keep breaking up. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. How about now? Yeah. Is that better? Uh-huh. All right, but about political prisons, that we all were studying the whole time we were in jail. And uh, the study in law, we had access to the law library. We, we used that. We helped other prisons. Some prisons couldn't even read or write. We wrote, wrote their letters for them to their families. We were always organizing. That's why today they never put political prisoners in population. The inmates love political prisoners. It makes no threat to a, to a political prison. It's the guards and the police. I mean, people that's running the place. And they want to break you. And you know that. They want to break you. That's the soul breaker. But I won that case in Los Angeles. I beat that case at six counts of attempted murder and uh, eight counts of assault on a police officer. And all, all those counts, I, I won in court. I was acquitted by a jury of 12 people. The Black Panther Party in Los Angeles changed the jury selection in Los Angeles. We demanded in my trial that I get a jury of my peers, my immediate community, not take me to Torrance or to Santa Monica. No, you take me right here in South Central where my people are and try me in front of them. And they did that, they had to. They had to go all the way to the state Supreme Court. We won the case. So jury selection was done by your driver's license. But that driver's license had to be in this designated area where you were arrested at. And there had to be homeowners. I've been living in that area. And that's where the jury pool was selected. So the, the fight continues on all levels. And political prisoners are always fighting. We never stop fighting. We fight the laws. We fight discrimination in prison, in jails. We fight for prison. We fought for blankets. Off of blankets. When I got to, when they brought me to San Francisco from, from Florida on that indictment, on that murder. I hadn't been in a jailhouse in 30 years. They put, took me straight to the hole. But when I got there, it was inmates that sent me care packages that didn't even know me, that but knew of me. And they all told me, I want to thank you, brothers, for these blankets. Because we know if we went for you guys, we wouldn't have these blankets. So the fight, I say that to say, the fight continues on all levels, no matter what the situation. You know, you got to continue to resist and fight, but you got to pick your fights. You know, you pick your fights, and I pick the ones I can win. Yeah. Strategy and tactics applies to all of our lives. And once I joined the party and learned those things, and then became a member of the Black Liberation Army. It was an extension it's from one level to the next level. Because in the Black Panther Party, in the rules of the party, it says you can never join any other organization other than the Black Liberation Army. So when the federal government destroyed the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army came about. But the Black Liberation Army has always been here from the moment they took that first African off the, off the continent. They created Nat Turner, Denmark, Vesey, all those great soldiers and warriors, the forgotten one. You know, we always resisted. 
we never fold up under this pressure. They would have young people to think and believe that, but we never fold. We always rise. We're the most relentless people on the planet. So I say that to say, I love this struggle. And I'll be in this thing until the day I die. Um, I have two questions from people that are, uh, that are tuning in. So I'm gonna run them by both of you. And the first question is based off a comment that, uh, that you said, Harold and Dequi, you, uh, you co-signed on. And it's about how visibility on prisoners can help keep them alive. How the more visible a prisoner is inside, the less likely they are to get fucked up by the administration. That's right. So if you could like just kind of expand on that about how the extra eyes keep people safe, um, the, the listener would really appreciate that. Well, you know, another thing, lawyers do a, do a great part too. Hell yeah. Because I had a lawyer, her name was Beth Lizzie and she passed away and I loved her to death. She <laughs> country girl from Nebraska, a little red-headed country girl, smart as a whip, dressed like a hippie in it, very deceptive. But she made sure that I was out of my cell once a day, every day. That I got a chance to come out and exercise, walk up and down the tier for at least 30 minutes every day. Because they wouldn't let you do that unless somebody was there representing you. You, you got to file your own rent sometimes. You know, anybody that's been in jail know that you got to file writs and motions to get different things. And you could do it from your cell. You don't have nothing but time. Nothing but time. It's one long day and one long night. You don't remember yesterday. It's always looking forward. And survival is a necessity. In inmates, your best protected because they give you headache. They give you a heads up. Political prisoners get more information than they have in prison. Yeah. Because people want to talk to you. Because yeah. they want to know what makes you the way you are. Especially young people. And they're willing to do things for you. Smuggle little stuff for you. Smuggle you an onion or, a, you know, a tomato. Wow, a tomato. You know, I didn't see a tomato for a year. But little things like that. You know, you just... uh. And you gotta, you, you gotta play games with the pigs. <laughs> you know? But you never let them know they hurt you. You never ask them for shit. You know, you don't, and you don't complain and you don't snivel because they want you to grovel anyway. You know, everything you say and do, they walk behind your cell and, you know, back there where the pipes are and stuff. And they sit back there and they put microphones there to listen to conversations. It's always something going on in jail. Mm -hmm. And I was in jail with Geronimo Pratt. Oh. And uh, we did a year together, along with the members of the SLA. They were behind the door. Oh, you know, we see them every day. But the pigs will tell you, don't talk to them. Yeah. The hell are you going to tell me not to talk to them? <laughs> We're going to threaten me with the hole. I'm already in the damn hole. You know? A hole is just another part of the jail. You just be by yourself. That's all. But, uh, or, so, I don't know if I can add to that. I, I, I'll let the question. For potential young, say, young, people, young people watching, um, I hope you heard what Harold said. Don't talk to these fucking cops. Don't talk to them bitches. In jail, prison, do not, they're not your fucking friends. Right. Ah, damn. You got the right to remain silent. That's a big heads up right there. Inside and out. What's it gonna do for you? Yeah. And they trick people into talking to them. They are not your friends. So they gonna have it so that they you they gather their information gatherers. No matter the, the most yes. what might seem like an innocent question is never an innocent question. They're it's always there. about gathering information. But I, I think that you know, um when you at when the you said the um the the participant acts like like to expand to, to expand on that. I think that when Harold said about eyes on, right? If your loved one gets beat up and you don't come to visit for a month, you'll never know that. But if you go to visit on, you know, a couple of times a month or however long, or if they, you know, they can make a phone call, you write a letter, um, you know, you when you visit, at least in New York, 
we took pictures. I, you know, I don't remember doing that. I never visited Sekou in federal, and I can't remember if when, um, yeah, you do take pictures in federal because I remember visiting Sundiata and taking pictures, right? So that all eyes, you know, like people say that same two heads are better than one. Like if you keep everything in your head. When you speak it to someone else, it helps you to process it and think about it in a different way. It's the same thing with the eyes. So it's for your benefit, it's for your um, your loved one's benefit, but it's also to hold the prison administration accountable to say, we, we care. You may not care about this person, but we care. And right. we're gonna make sure that they're okay. So if they right. can't come to the visiting room, why can't they come to the visiting room? If they come and they're all beat up, why? Right? So it's just, and it's also just making sure they're alive because sometimes those pigs kill people. Right? right? So like the keeping eyes, it's like, it's the ties that bind. It's like the inside out. Like that's like, when we're talking I about know. Black August, that's what it is. From the inside to the outside, from the outside to the inside. Mm -hmm. um, so like for people listening I'd like to make a comparison we wouldn't know about these uprisings if they're not videotaped if there's not books about them if there's not uh, ways for us to see them happening it's the same way in prison it's the same way you don't know what's going on in there unless you are paying attention and showing up and so with that um, Gaykui I'd like to start with you and then we can go to Harold on this next question that's from the listener um, they're asking what sort of situations have you found where like you needed to call the jail and check on someone or you need to do a call in campaign to get them health care? You need to do a call in campaign to get them moved or any situation like that. Like when have you found that necessary and when have you found it helpful? Well, there have been call campaigns for if someone is not feeling well and they need to see a doctor. Why haven't they seen a doctor? Right, like Kamal Siddiqui is having serious health problems. So there's always a, a campaign to call to like not to amputate somebody's leg. Like Matulu, they wanted to amputate his, his foot. He was like, no, right? So there, a lot of times it has to do with medical stuff, but the other stuff, like what Howard was saying with the lawyer, the law, the can't the lawyers do the work if someone is not getting their outside, you know, getting, being able to go to commissary, not being able to go outside, not being able to get visitors, right? So the lawyer does some of those things, even though the, the, the prison won't give you information, the fact that we call lets them know yep. that people are watching. And they, those calls and those faxes and those emails disrupt yep. their day. That's right. And if you flood their fax machine, that's tying up. If you call in their office, then that means that somebody has to answer those phone calls. So they won't give you information, but it lets them know that you're calling about so and so. You're calling about the mistreatment. You're talk you're calling about the neglect. You're calling about the well-being. You're calling about whatever it is the incident. So we've had call campaigns, we've had fax campaigns. We've had lots of things where lawyers get involved to demand. And Howard is right. The, the lawyers play movement attorneys and we need more of them. Much more. But, yeah. right? Absolutely. Because there was movement attorneys in, in those days that, that held the line for our political prisoners. Right? That's what helped to stop Sekou from being tortured when he was captured. He held, he heard Bill Kunstler's voice booming down the hallway and mm -hmm. they had to stop torturing him, right? So the it's the lawyers that do that, what they do and it's the people that do what we do. But it's to say that we got eyes on our loved ones and we got eyes on you officials. Oh, we got eyes on all of you. We got eyes all over you. It brought me to uh, San Francisco. I was talking to Hank and Ray Boudreau, because we was up on the, they were in the cell next to me. And they told me not to talk. The police told me not to talk to them. I'm fucking for 30 years. What the hell are you talking about? I can't talk to them. So they moved me from that cell. I thought they were just going to move me from that cell. They moved me out of the jail 
to set <laughs> the jail out of the whole damn county. My lawyer, nobody knew where I was. And they took me over to solitary confinement, put me in there. They 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 took my commissary and everything. Well, I, I wasn't sniveling, you know, just give me my little bedroll and I go on in the fucking cell, right? I stayed there for three days. My lawyer couldn't find me. You know who found me? Inmates told their people that they had me there. Yeah. I told them, I said, they, nobody knows where I am. I said, they can kill me. Yep. And then they should call, call out to their people and their people, my people, and let them know what was going and going on there, how they was treating me. Yep. So it's real important that you open those communication lines. I had the same incident in New Orleans. Take us to court that morning. It was the you cover, how are you covering the camera, brother? We can't oh. see your face. Okay. All right. <laughs> See your hand. All right. How about that? Is that better? <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what am I doing? I, I you covering the top that's of the computer. Yeah, that's, that's better. How about now? Okay. And, okay, like in, in uh, New Orleans, they weren't gonna take us to court. The inmates went over there and sold us. They got three men over there that they've beaten, and they've been there since Friday, and they've been torturing them. The judge asked the, the district attorney, "Did they have three more people?" He said, yeah, but they were security risk. And he wanted to be, the judge said, you have to bring them to a rain. Bring us over there to a rain. Well, we had to carry Reuben Scott because his arm was broken and his legs messed up from being beaten. So me and JB was chained up and we carried him. We had to walk across the street from the city jail to Paris prison in chains with a SWAT team surrounding us because they thought somebody was coming to get us. And then we go over there to Paris prison to court. And the judge remains his back in the custody of the sheriffs. I mean, the, the New Orleans Police Department. So when they get us back over there, they start torturing us again. And he told them not to talk to any of us without a lawyer being present. They didn't give a damn about that. The government told them to do what they had to do because they wanted Herman Bell. They wanted Ray Boudreaux. They wanted Hank Jones. And they wanted other people. And they said that we weren't going to leave that until we talk about it. So I never mentioned any of them cats. But when I got over to the jails, they put us in a giant bird cage. And when they fed us with maggots and the rice and, and beans. You had to pick maggots out to eat it. I went in there weighing 195 pounds. I'm six foot two and a half. I come out of there. I weighed 134 pounds when they extradite me back to California. And I went from one hole to another. <laughs> and I got to California. It was, it's a different deal because they already knew me here. And so I just went to the hole and my case came up. I got a severance from my co-defendants because I was accused of being the shooter. And I said, since I'm the shooter, I'll go to trial. If they can't get me, they can't get nobody. So I fought the case on self-defense. You got a self-defense law in California. You have a right to defend yourself, even from the police. And they they showed where the police conspired to come and kill us. And they found me not guilty and they let my co-defendants go. Oh. Just say some can I just say something to what Brother Harold just said? That is a level of commitment, comradeship, loyalty, um, brotherhood and sisterhood. Like I know of people like what 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 um Harold just said of his experience. He said, I severed the case because I'm gonna use myself to say if they can't get me, they can't get you. When Sekou got captured, first they didn't know who he was, right? And then they when they found out they were beating the shit out of him, flushing his head in the toilet, putting cigarettes out on his legs, pulling out his toenails, like do all kinds of stuff beating him, like he said, with those batons. Um, they beat him into a three-month hospital stay. But they was asking about Asada, and they was asking about Abdul Majid. And he was not giving them up. I know of people that took a bid, a brother who is now gone, who took a bid in order to prevent a sister who had children from, take, from, from being um, swept up. 
So there's a level of loyalty and comradeship and co love and commitment to each other right. that just does not exist today because right. people will snitch in a heartbeat. You know, people say that they won't. They say snitches get stitches and all this other stuff. But you let people get busted and they start offering you, they tell you if you don't cooperate, you're going to get a hundred years. They, they will snitch on, they, they will talk about their mama. That's right. They offered me uh, $150,000 to relocate me, me and my family anywhere in the country. To lie on my friend. I told him I can't do that. I can't lie on my friend. For you and for nobody else, I'm not going to lie on them. Right. So I'm loyal, only loyal to those. Right. For, uh, for any young revolutionaries watching, please do not... Uh, do not participate in this life if you're not willing to do that time. Please do not snitch on everyone. Right. God damn. Um, I right. Let me just let me just add that Kamal Siddiqui is in prison today simply because of his loyalty to the Black Freedom Struggle, his loyalty and his commitment to his daughter and the mother of his daughter, because the they offered him the re yeah Asada Shakur right. They offered him the reward. And they told him when the FBI came to visit him in 2001, 2002, that they offered him the reward. And they said, we want you to help lure her away so we can get her. And he said the same thing that Harold said. And they told him, well, we can guarantee you if you do not cooperate, we're going to make sure you spend the rest of your life in prison. And so what did they do upon that refusal? They charged him with a 30-year-old crime that they had to dropped the charges before and 30 years ago because that he was it was no evidence against them so they you know this whatever they do this cold case whatever they do but they convicted him and he's serving now two life sentences plus 10 years we we had his daughter on here a couple episodes ago so i really encourage people to get involved with uh kamal Siddiqui's case try to raise his name up um also i want to shout out my lawyers i had really badass lawyers Sandy Freeman, Erica Unger, and Z Williams. Like, thank you for keeping me alive inside the Supermax. Um, so I want to ask you both. One of the one of the purposes of rattling the cages, this book, was to raise up voices that people may have forgotten. That to keep alive the spirit and the heart of these revolutionaries that put their lives on the line. What what do you think is missing right now, or what do you think could be done? to raise up voices more? What do we need to do to amplify the voices or the lives of those inside right now? Well, you know, like Kwame Ture says, organize, organize, organize. We need, I'm, I'm with um, our sister, Seku and I, sister friend, Nancy, right? Mansour, she is Palestinian, existence is resistance, is, is her company she works for, you know? And so, um, they just, you know, um, we need, she used to, she did a hip hop tour, like black, like MXG did a hip hop tour, Black August, you know, using artists to amplify the voices. I was with, I'm, I'm with her and we were in the car last night and she played me all these songs. She played me a song by uh, Imani Black called uh, Free Palestine. Um, and it was talking about, you know, F this one, F that one, y'all doing this, the government, these misleaders, these pop these uh, politicians. So you need the poets, the writers, the authors, the organizers, the lawyers, the doctors, the working people to amplify the voices and to say, you know, we need books, we need zines, we need newspaper articles, we need radio shows, we need every organ that's available. And sometimes we got to make our own in order to get the voices out because the master's tools are never going to be used to free the people, right? So, but we got to use everything and we got to challenge people. One, we got to support the people that do the work to support political prisoners. Those artists that, you know, M1, Dead Press, they've always been down for political prisoners. Dead Press. Yes, uh, <laughs> Immortal Technique, right? Yes. Nejma Nefertiti. Right? Wait, they did a great job. Yes, 
So it's all we got to support these artists and big them up because they do the work of resistance through their art, right? right? Hey, you know, I I just want to say one thing, really, Keith. We don't. Work, I never work for individuals. You know, I work for the people. I, I, that's who I love. The people first. I never forgot who I work for. Many people in the party forgot who they work for. But being loyal to the people is like what we had in the party. Let's have an undying love for the people to continue this struggle. And but the key thing to everything is like you were talking about, sister was saying, the information has to get out there to the people. Because the information is the raw material for new ideas. And at the same time, you gotta learn, young people have to learn. Do not talk to the fucking police. <laughs> Step one, don't talk to the cops. Right. When they ask you questions, that means they, they, they don't know. So don't volunteer any information. Don't conversate with them at all. Right. That's the key thing. But educate. you got to get back in community and let the people know you don't have to fear us because we work with work for you, not against you. And we got to make sure that we get that information out to the pimps, the prostitutes, the drug dealers, you can't do that here. That's how we we clean out this, right here in this neighborhood where I am now. It's full of drugs now. But when I was in the party, we cleared all that out. Bigger Roars right over here. This is what they call a, the whole stroke. There's no pimps and prostitutes on Big Roar. We ran all those cats out of here. But you got to get it organized to come back. But the government helped flood, flood the community with gangs. When they destroyed the Black Panther Party, they created yeah. a young people not to go, and they scared everybody by the way they did us. You know, more Panthers are killed in L.A. than anywhere in the country. Something like 25, 30, something like that. Mostly by the LAPD. So the struggle here has always been hectic. Right now, there's no even no acknowledgement that the Black Panther Party ever existed. In right. Los very little information here. Yep. Um, yep. Before, uh, we only got a couple minutes left, but I'd like to ask both of you, like, if there's anything you're working on right now, if there's anything that, like, any projects you want to talk about, any prisoners you want to talk about, any friends, family, uh, Seku's book that may be coming out hopefully soon, his memoirs, anything you guys want to bring up, like, please, please talk about it now. Well, Sekou, Asha Bendeli is was co-writing Sekou's memoir with him, and you know she's we're, we're going to be working together to like finish it up with some last minute things, and then um, hopefully it'll be out in um, in twenty twenty five. I am part of the the Spirit of Mandela Coalition, which Sekou was a part of. And that's, they've organized into a people senate that is like different regions around the country to organize people, to, to network with people so people can know what is going on in different parts of the country because we can't be everywhere. So, but knowing, working with people helps us to understand what's going on in different, you know, uh, one struggle, different fronts. So it helps us to know what is going on. There are various curb fests, you know, in support of political prisoners happening around the country, right? So there's one in Boston, there's one in New York, there's one in Philly. So they can just like, you know, do the Google search and, you know, find out. Um, there's all this, 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 this ongoing campaign for, for Mumia and, you know, uh, Kamal and Imam Jamil Alameen. Um, you know, these are brothers that have um, been in prison for decades. I know that Imam Jamil Alameen. Yeah, well, he hasn't been in it for 50 years. He's been in year, He's been in since the early um, 2000s because the same yeah. judge that oh, convicted okay. and sentenced Kamal is the same one that sentenced um, Imam Jamil in Atlanta for doing the same thing that what... Um, Brother Harold was talking about cleaning up the neighborhood. And the person that um, allegedly shot the sheriff, um, was they said was shot. Yet when Imam Jamil was captured, he had no bullet wounds. And the FBI was known as saying, we finally got him. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because of who he is, they've had eyes on him because they don't forget. So I guess if like to in, in, in short, the answer to your question, I think if I can leave the audience with anything, it's like we must have as long a memory as the state does. Right. Because they don't forget. They don't they forget shit. They do not forget. And so that Sekou was in prison for 33 and a half years. When he came home, every police precinct in New York City was notified that he was home. There so we people. need to remember the struggle, the commitment, the sacrifice that people have made, just like the state remembers their resistance. So while the state, like people are glorifying the Black Panther Party today, sweatshirts, movies, Wakanda forever, people think that's the Panther, right? But there's still people in prison today because they refuse to renounce or denounce the Black Panther Party just because of their association. Right. Really? So we, right. You know, uh, and at, at, at this time, Dr. Curtis Austin, he's writing a book on the San Francisco 8. Oh, good. Okay. Hell yeah. It'll be out next year. I'm going to write a biography on, on my life, on my life story. And so that, that particular book is going to be called Different Kind of Cat. Different Kind of Cat? Yeah. A, a Panther's always a different kind of cat. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the name of that book. So on my life story. But still, I, I just want to make sure to educate young people to let them know that, that we're still here and we, we, we're we talkable. You can talk to us. You, you can come up and touch us and talk to us. You know, that's what we're here for. I work for the people. Like I said, I don't work for individuals. Never will. You know, so uh, that's, that's what I want to add to that. And I, I appreciate you having me to interview me and give me the opportunity to see my dear sister. Absolutely, brother. I love you. <laughs> I'd uh, I'd like to just remind people, like before we before we sign off here, like what Harold was saying, these prisons are still full, um, and there's still elderly and like older uh, Panthers, BLA members. All these activists are still here that we can gain wisdom from, we can gain knowledge from, we can grow as a community. So please, let's use these tools. Let's like let's get to know these people and hear their stories. And we prisoners are available. Yeah, they're, they're here. They're here. Right. Thank you both so much. This was a real honor. I, I love you both, and I thank you both so much. Thank I got you, Eric. And in this time of Black August, is study, sacrifice, right? Read, study, fast, whatever you're fasting from. It could be fasting from social media for a week. It could be fasting from alcohol. It could be fasting from the things that don't do your body or your mind or your spirit any good. But study it, right? You got to have context, right? The only way to be in this movement is to understand that it's a protracted struggle and that also we must have solidarity with peoples around the world, right? Because what happens here is this same, this government is doing to other people around the world. So those things, study, sacrifice, commitment, fast. That's what Black August is about. That's what our lives must be about. That's right. That's right. Till the day we die. That's right. All right, let me close out. Y'all are amazing. Um, total inspirations. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been amazing. Um, and thank you, Eric. A huge appreciation to you for helping to make this happen and carrying the conversation forward. And thank you to your listening audience for being here and participating. We appreciate that. We are nothing without the people because we do have the power. Oh, so yeah. Thank you both. Oh, yeah. yeah. In, the words of, in the words of Miles Say Tongue, you dare to struggle, you dare to win. That's right. Mm. And that's always been our motto in the Black Panther Party. It's about the struggle. Struggle first. Struggle. Struggle. Consistently. Resist. Yep. At, at every turn. Our liberty closes out. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.